Now, get ready for the last speaker of the day here on the main stage uh, on the first day of President's Summit 2021. And again, the last speaker before the night summit opens, he's waiting in the wings. Come on in, George. Uh, he's a world-leading expert, a professor emeritus at Imperial College in London, one of the most respected strategy minds in the world. Put your hands together for George Yip. George. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> So now I live in Boston, but it's great to be back in Denmark, the happiest country in the world. So I'm just looking around the room. Uh, the people are not looking happy. Perhaps you don't live in Denmark. <laughs> anyway, in the brief 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about a new concept, actually, that uh, I and a co-author developed a year ago, and we published in Harvard Business Review. And it's based on my personal experience, which I'll talk about a bit, although I've worked primarily as an academic, as and as a consultant. At one point, I became the dean of the largest business school in the Netherlands, 7,500 students, 500 faculty and staff. I felt I was responsible for 8,000 souls. I had never been to the country. I didn't speak the language. I'd never been to the school. How was I going to deliver on my strategic initiative? And I realized I had to develop organization intelligence for myself. Not that I knew that concept at the time. I only developed this afterwards when I reflected back on my experience. So of course, now, the dilemma for leaders, and you've been hearing about this you know, in other sessions, for a corporate leader like yourselves, you're one person who needs to motivate an organization of thousands or hundreds of thousands, or even, even if it's 10 or 100 people, to implement the strategy. And by the way, I deliberately have this picture of the leader, the redfish, facing in a different direction. If you're not initially leading the organization in a different direction from where they're going already, why do they need you? Right? If the organization is already doing everything that you want, they don't need you anymore. So very often, the leader is there to put in strategic initiatives that are difficult. The job of a leader is difficult. It is to get the organization to do things it would not be doing anyway. So one of my uh, comments about strategy is that if a, the reason why strategy is difficult is that if the organization were already doing it, you wouldn't need that as a strategy. You can move on to the next difficult strategy. So this is all about how to implement the next or current difficult strategy, because you want to align. Sorry, this is the only diagram I could get. But the leader is in front with them shooting arrows in your back sometimes, because there'll always be some in the ranks who are shooting the arrows at you. And I really experienced this in academia. Uh, this concept's also been called Making Elephants Dance. Professor Rosabeth Moss Cantor at Harvard Business School talked about this, how do you get an organization to work together? And there's some very interesting research by um, a, whoops, I'm stuck. Hey guys, can you help me? Okay. Um, why do organizations get stuck strategically? Well, the environment changes, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly. What are organizations good at doing? They are good at changing slowly. Sorry. Hmm. Ah, right. They're good at changing slowly, the red line. At this point, the gap between the red line and the blue line is not very big, not a big problem. Now, what happens? The environmental change accelerates, and the organization keeps going on at this slow, incremental pace. And now there's a big gap between where the environment says you should be and where the organization is. And this is what we call the, uh, my colleagues call the stage of strategic drift. What do companies do at this point? They say, we need a new strategy. Let's bring in Bain and Company and other consultants, right? <laughs> and I, so, I mean, as a consultant, I, we love this phase, you know. But, um, and at this point, what, what do they do? They fire the CEO, right? They either do a strategic transformation or they die. Uh, I don't have time to talk about this, but General Motors was like a car crash 30 years in the making before they went bankrupt. So, why does a company like, General Motors get stuck. First of all, individual cognitive limits. They literally couldn't see, the senior executives could not see that the Japanese cars were better because they didn't drive the Japanese cars themselves. Furthermore, every time they drove their car into the company parking lot, their cars were serviced and they were always perfect. So when the American customers said, General Motors cars are not reliable, the top executives said, what do you mean? My car is perfect. They were not having the same experience as their customers. Steady as you go, companies get rigid, and we've heard this earlier on this morning, 
They get stuck and know what the hell to do. It's also the organizational culture, if you think about it. Uh, and the internet being the prime example, when companies went from bricks and mortar to the internet, who are the people at the top of the company? They got there with the bricks and mortar strategy. How comfortable were they with the internet strategies? They were not. So by definition, the people at the top of the company, when the environment changes, they are obsolete. And you have to replace them with some new leaders. That is an extremely painful process. And this is some, and the lag performance effects, similarly. So again, you know, your, your customer liking is being hollowed out while you're managing performance. And I saw Roger Smith, the CEO of General Motors, talking up his company as it was rotting away underneath him. All right, so lag performance effects. And this is summed up by the Icarus paradox of thinking you're far more successful than you really are. Anybody ever heard this comment? Our strategy is to be number one. Is that a strategy? No, it is not. It is an aspiration. It's a target. And I highlight this because people sometimes forget to deliver the strategies to get to number one. So I talk about focusing on the right part of strategy. People sometimes talk about business models, how we operate. So Amazon, when it started, had a tremendous business model. We also have strategic objectives, such as being number one. Now there's a missing critical element. What's the missing element? I call them uh, strategic moves. And that is a dynamic, jagged arrow, because it is dynamic, it changes over time. I don't care which of these three terms you use, but I want you to understand that strategy has three parts. The static business model, which doesn't change very quickly. The strategic objectives, which you, know, you set some objectives every year, but typically you might have a three to five year overall strategic objective. And then you have the dynamic strategic moves that you're struggling with all the time to combine the three. I, I love the idea of using clever strategies, clever strategic moves. Now, at least two people today, including Sir Martin <coughs> Sorrell and the speaker on innovation, used a boxing analogy about being punched in the mouth. I knew this. You, use a clever strategy. So when Muhammad Ali tried to win back the championship against the much younger George Foreman, everyone said he'd lose. What strategy did he use? The roper dope Strategy wins. So this is an example of a strategy that is not obvious, that is clever, that outsmarts the competition. He did not go toe-to-toe -to -toe with George Foreman. He would have lost. This is all just preamble to set up my concept of why, given that strategy is so difficult and organizations are so rigid, that as a leader, you need this new concept that I coined called organizational intelligence. OQ, not IQ or EQ, or even BQ, right? BQ, you need to understand the business. EQ and IQ, the ability to influence others. By the way, if a leader is too much EQ, too much emotional intelligence, you won't be that successful as a leader because you're going to be too nice to people. I was never that nice to people, right? That's, that's, that's why I became a, a leader. <clears throat> OQ harnesses much or all of an organization to magnify a leader's words and actions. And OQ can also make up for a lack of EQ. When I arrived as the head of Rotterdam School of Management, I knew I did not have the highest IQ. I was perhaps above average, but there are always other professors smarter than you. Manny Macheda probably didn't, doesn't have the highest IQ in Bain. It's full of super smart people. I mean, his EQ is pretty good, and my EQ is above average, but it's certainly not the best. They're always, you know, very nice people with great EQ, but as I said, they're not the best leader. So now I'm going to explain what these elements are. So in our article with my colleague Nelson Phillips, um, we describe this as five competencies. And I'm going to have an individual slides on each of the five, so I won't go through them. I just want to show you there are five now. The first one is selective messaging. Right? One of the best messages from history, uh, and the British uh, love to remember their previous victories because there aren't so many today. Before the Battle of Trafalgar, Nelson sent up a signal that with only these eight words or so, England expects that every man will do his duty. That was it, not some long message about bravery and courage and everything else. And the modern version of this, my favorite, is lean in. What a tremendous message Sheryl Sandberg sent to women, not just in her own organization, but in organizations everywhere. My own personal application of this at Rotterdam, 
I needed the faculty to start publishing not just in academic journals, but in managerial journals such as Harvard Business Review. So you know, I, I brought in people to train them, I gave them a financial reward, and whenever someone published occasionally in one of those managerial journals, I sent an email congratulating them, uh, CCing all 500 faculty and staff. When someone published in an academic journal, no message. This was not popular, but this is selective messaging. Right, so what are you trying to change? You message about the change and the successes of the change. So again, be willing to be unpopular. I had the advantage that I had a five-year contract and I knew I wasn't going to stay and I didn't have to be popular. Um, and you know, you know Dutch culture is rather similar to Danish culture. They want to discuss everything and agree on everything. Um, not, not for me. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 I mean, I, I did it very politely, but I remember at one meeting, one, uh, you know, I said, okay, we have a consensus, we'll do it. And one of the Dutch professors said, no, we don't have a consensus, I disagree. I said, Hans, a consensus is not unanimity, we're going to do it. <clears throat> the second one is rebel from the top. Really effective leaders learn early to target only the important issues where they have a fair shot at winning. So you take on the biggest challenges only when you have the most firepower. And I've done that throughout my life, you know, from the age of 14 in a British boarding school where you could be a rebel without a cause, but I waited until I was senior enough to make the changes. And everywhere I've been, I've moved up to higher positions and then I've made the dramatic changes as I did at uh, Rotterdam School of Management. <clears throat> this one I love, stage moments of theater. So instead of sending out long memos and giving long speeches, stage a moment of theater to send out your central strategic message. A good theatrical moment reverberates throughout the organization and effective moments of theater have three important characteristics. It's a clear message, it's out of the ordinary and unexpected, and it's generally low cost, requiring limited planning, sometimes on the spot, and relatively easy to execute. One of my favorite examples, Louis V. Gersler Jr. took over at IBM, he saved IBM in the 90s. One of the things he did, he came to Europe early on, <clears throat> you know, during European integration period, he called in all the heads of each country in Europe, UK, Denmark, etc. And he said, from now on, you are going to need an integrated European strategy. And if even one of you doesn't cooperate, the strategy will fail. But here's the moment of theater. And if any of you don't want to cooperate in the strategy, you should leave the room now. And then he stood in silence and looked at them for two minutes. And nobody left the room. By this moment of theater, he basically tricked everybody into accepting the new strategy. You know, Europeans love to say how they're different from each other, right? Oh, Denmark is so different from Sweden and from Norway, etc. So he just ran over this with this moment of theater. They had accepted the new strategy without a lot of uh, discussion. Here, here's another one. <clears throat> Steve Jobs. When they showed him one of the early iPod prototypes, he said, it's not small enough. And the designer said, there's no more room. So he took the prototype, he dropped it in a tank of water, and bubbles started to come out. See, there's still room. <laughs> that was a moment of theater. And then, right, that's the, the iPod. <clears throat> China did not used to be known for quality. So, the head of the largest appliances company, Hire, now the world's largest as well, early on, in 1985, he pulled out 76 defective washing machines, small defects, a scratch, etc. And he gave sledgehammers to um, about a dozen employees, and he took one himself, he said, smash these defective machines. He didn't send out a message, he didn't give a speech, he smashed some machines, he staged a moment of theater. Today, one of those um, hammers is in the head office. There I am wielding the hammer. There's a continual loop showing this and an, in head office and another hammer is on display in the Beijing National Museum. That is a moment of theater. Next, foster and ethos. And I spent um, five years as a professor at the top business school in China. So I have some Chinese examples that I published about China. <clears throat> Huawei the scariest Chinese company in telecoms, right? The world's largest uh, telecommunications equipment company. They actively talk about a wolf spirit. Well, you know what wolves do, they hunt in packs. And the CEO, look, look at the advertising. It shows a ballet dancer's deformed feet. 
could you run an ad like that in, in Denmark? I mean, you'd probably be prosecuted or something like that. For <clears throat> and, and look at what he says here. Huawei people, especially the leaders, are destined to work hard for a lifetime and to devote more and suffer more than others. How is that for a recruiting slogan? How do you think they do on Glassdoor? <clears throat> uh, right. But th this is how Chinese uh, companies operate, with this strong ethos of the company. And then, oh, I'm stuck again, wait a minute. Use an action strategy. I only discovered this quote after I retired and when I was writing up a different article about my experience. And I suddenly realized, this is what I'm doing. So Richard Pascal, Stanford Business School, it is easier to act your way into a better way of thinking than to think your way into a better way of acting. So I didn't try to get the faculty to rethink our strategy. I just set up several strategic initiatives, had coalitions of the willing to get them to start doing things. So action strategies really work. So here I am being parachuted in, never managed more than 15 people, with these nearly 8,000 people. Just one small example, we launched, and this is a great example of a teamwork. It wasn't my idea, it was the marketing manager and our second advertising agency. We fired the first advertising agency, it didn't come good An I will social media campaign. Instead of us telling other people what to think about us, we got RSM community members, from the dean down to students, an I will campaign. I will, you know, I will, uh, I will give a voice to the silent. You know, I will embrace change and unlock potential. When we started this initially, some of the traditional Dutch faculty said, no, this is very un-Dutch, you know, it's, it's too egocentric, I will. But this campaign is still running after many years. Just uh, one example. Now, let me give you a corporate example. We've heard about culture. So, Satya Nadella became CEO in 2014 when Microsoft needed serious reboot flat stock price, product development lagging, failed move into smartphones, employees competing rather than collaborating. He had a new senior team, partly selected for empathy and respect for employees. Perhaps Bain helped him with this. From precision questioning to curiosity, they dropped the stack rankings, whereby people at the bottom of the rankings were fired. Right? Does that encourage you to cooperate with your teammates, knowing that the bottom person in your department will get fired each year? That, that started with General Electric. A growth mindset, admitting mistakes. He said something negative about women in an internal conference, and he apologized. He apologized, and that really turned things around, admitted his mate. So by 2019, they were once more the world's most valuable listed company, and two weeks ago, they were back again. People thought that Microsoft was down and out, once again the world's most valuable company, ahead of Apple and Alphabet. <clears throat> I'll finish up with a few slides on how to develop your personal OQ. People are constantly bad-mouthing bureaucracy. Hey, live with it. You cannot get rid of the bureaucracy <clears throat> in your company in the short term. Embrace it, but how do you do that? <clears throat> Use judo and not sumo, right? In, and, and many of you are from smaller companies. You know, a sumo strategy, you go head to head, it really only works if you're bigger than the other guy. Judo strategy, you use clever moves to overthrow the competition or to overthrow the opposition inside your, com your company. A side example, when British Airways was privatized, you know, BA used to stand for bloody awful. And, uh, one of the clever strategies the new CEO did, he ran an advertising campaign, British Airways, the world's favorite airline. When he first ran that, the employee said, you must be joking. But this was actually a clever strategy to the employee saying you have to live up to being the world's favorite airline. Similarly, the customers had to start expecting it. Develop, create your own per organizational persona. You know, if your nickname is Neutron Jack, like Jack Welch at General Electric, you walk into a room and people are already ready to do what you want. Right? Neutron Jack, he was called Neutron Jack because he'd come to, to a facility and he'd clear out all the people and only the buildings were left. And, and the Chinese equivalent is Dong Min Chu, CEO of Gri Electric Appliances, and her, what they say about her is, where Sister Dong walks, no grass grows. She is really, really tough, and I have met her. She is scary. <laughs> <coughs> and I don't scare easily. And lastly, 
follow the small rules so you can break the big rules. Again, I've applied this in my life. Uh, don't tell my wife that. Um, all right. Don't mess up your organizational persona. In, in the article, I talk about how one banking CEO finally got fired because there was an accounting problem, but it accumulated breaking small rules until this big rule was broken. Be willing to transform yourself first. I was at an event like this, and I was talking about, ah, oh, I'm not worried about online education. Uh, that's not you know, real MBA. And some of the executives called me up. He said, George, you've been telling us about, don't say I'm not worried about X, Y, Z. Um, so that was me in 2014. And two years later, that's me teaching online at Imperial College, where we were one of the pioneers in online. So even at my late age, I could learn a new trick. So transform yourself first. And last of all, my greatest personal learning, and uh, I almost don't dare show this, do what is best for the organization, even if it's a risk to your job. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I wonder how many of us would, how many of us would, Sorry? how many of us would do what's I, best for the organization, oh, 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 even and, if our jobs... And don't email me when you're fired uh, yeah. by following that advice. <laughs> yeah. uh, Slido is open, the app, so head on to Slido and, uh, and ask questions for George. Um, how would you rank EQ versus OQ versus IQ? If you only had to choose one... No, no, it, for a leader, OQ. 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 Uh, OQ. Um, and then BQ, actually, knowing about the business. I mean, IQ is important. Uh, the thing, of course, is that you're leading a team, so you can have other people who are better at the other things. But, um, I mean, in terms of EQ, th think about it. How good was the EQ of Steve Jobs? Right. He didn't have great EQ. He wasn't great with people. He had fantastic strategic vision, and he... You know, he had OQ as well. I mean, where I say someone like um, Bill Gates had really good OQ, I would say, he didn't have great EQ either. He, he, you know, he wasn't soft and cuddly. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm, I can't help but, th I have to apologize, the, the, the acoustics up here are a bit funny. Yeah, okay. So we sit right next to each other, but we can't hear each other. Just uh, so, oh, <laughs> all right. so you're not crazy. I can't hear you either, just so you know. Oh, I, I can hear. Oh, <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> funny, huh? <laughs> uh, with regards to the transformational change of a company, and, and really kind of, you know, like you, you showed the fish, with the one going that mm -hmm. way and all the others going that way, how much of it has to do with habit? And I feel like a lot of what we talk about in actuality goes back to, to changing your habits as opposed to anything else. Well, it's, it's, it's or, much... Or, or, sorry, or, and cultural habits. And, it, it's much more than habits. We heard earlier from another speaker that companies get locked in, right? That, that uh, structure, actually, it was, um, it was Martin Sorrell who said, you've got the wrong structure. So companies develop a structure to fit the current strategy. When the strategy needs to change, by definition, the old structure is wrong, and it's very hard to change the old structure. Uh, uh, that's, that's what the problem is. Um, and and then, there's the, then there's the culture as well, which takes a long time to change. So again, I try to change the culture through action. Uh, there's also a marketing concept called attitude follows action. So you get people starting to do things, and their attitude to it will change. So like their attitude to publishing in Harvard Business Review changed when they saw it could be done and it also connected us to the, to the business world. Do you think you need a strategy, a full strategy before you start taking action or can you take action and have a flexible strategy? I had a clear strategic objective, sort of agreed with the, the heads of the university to make us better connected to the business world to move us up in the rankings, to increase the revenues, etc. Those were objectives. The individual strategies evolved over time, and some of them were opportunistic as well. So, uh, you know, for a simple organization like a business school, you can do that. With a more complex organization, 
uh, you need to spend longer to do that. But again, I think as many of you are with um, smaller companies, um, it's maybe less hard for you to change your strategy. I'll, I'll give you an example of a difficult one. So at one point, Microsoft, when it was in trouble, bought Nokia. Complete failure. But they thought that might be good for them because they wanted to get more of their software onto phones. That was a difficult strategy. They tried it. They failed. Um, they weren't necessarily stupid, but you know, it was a, something that was very difficult and didn't work. I, I do wonder which massive companies, I mean, I remember covering Nokia almost 20 years ago, yeah, right? Yeah. And it was just, I mean, it's incredible, right? Like the, the, the cycle of these corporates. So can I just add something about strategy? People sometimes say, which is better, strategy or execution? Well, the hardest strategy to execute is the wrong strategy for your company. So I'd rather have 75% 75 execution, 75 execution of the right strategy than 100% execution of the wrong strategy. I also want to ask you briefly about risk. Yes. And then we'll get on to uh, your questions <clears throat> coming through thick and fast, so keep them coming in. Um, I was at a lunch, a small lunch with Gary Kasparov. Wow. And I mentioned him, this is a number of years ago, uh, the world number one chess player times a billion, you know, mind uh, like, uh, uh, you know, super sharp, right? And he had done a lot of research on risk, which you would in his chess playing field. And he had this theory that we no longer take or encourage risk. And he dared us around the table. We were about 10 or 12 people around the table. And he asked us, he said, after, or there used to be a time when we did things because we could, like going to the moon. Kennedy sent someone to the moon because we could. It wasn't to discover anything or do anything, or it was just because we could. Some muscle flexing between the US and the Russians. So Kasparov was saying that since the moon, or take it back a bit further, since the invention uh, of the telephone, you haven't actually had completely new inventions. We don't pile money into new inventions anymore. We piggyback off of things that already are invented. And if you think about it like, the iPhone. Well, the iPhone came about because of the mission to the moon, which then meant that the military invested a lot of money into this technology, the early, the ARPANET, which was before the internet, which then becomes eventually your iPhone. Do you think that there is now a, that the transformational game in corporates, is it a lot more risk averse as well? Are leaders also met with this kind of, you know, the, 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 the organizational intelligence has to include an unwillingness to take risk to the same extent that we once were allowed? It, it, depends, on the, it, it depends on the company because companies with a lot of fixed assets, installed base, they're not so willing to take uh, risks. But we see continually, you know, smaller companies taking risks. I mean, look at Tesla. I mean, so there are entrepreneurs like yourselves who will take the risks. And when you take it to the personal level, I found that the older I get and the more success I've had in my career, the more willing I am to take risks. So, you know, that last slide I showed was really my view later in my career when I could afford to be fired. I was always ready to be fired. I think maybe when I was 30, I wasn't so ready to be fired. And we noticed in COVID, you know, my wife and I being much older, we took much more risks than our children. So we have less to lose. <laughs> right. yeah. I like the argument. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, let's do some, some uh, rapid questions. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give your 30-year-old self? God, I, I, I was a mess when I was 30. I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't figure out my career path until I was 40. Um, so uh, I, I would say... Don't worry so much that you haven't found the right fit yet. Keep investing in doing things that will build your career. So my career has been a series of almost accidents, but I've gradually built strategic options for myself. You know, I, I ended up becoming a quasi-expert on China innovation, having not started out like that, but I just happened to have taught in China for a while, and then later on, I happened to take a job as VP of Research and Innovation at a major consulting company, and then the opportunity came up to run a center. Oh, and then I was the dean of the Netherlands, and then uh, the opportunity came up to run a research center on innovation in China funded by Dutch companies. And 
the three things came together. So I hadn't planned that, but you know, if you keep investing in good experiences, they'll eventually uh, come together. I haven't had the luxury of somebody like Ma uh, Manny Macheda who could join one company and stay with them. I mean, if you can do that, fantastic. If you can't, don't worry about it too much. Just you know, make sure the things you do sort of fit together in some way. What's your view on keeping a high-performing person on board who is a bad team player? I don't like the bad team players either. So, I mean, uh, and I've pushed them out um, if they're toxic. Um, see if you can, you know, hive them off into a corner. I mean, Google, for example, now has a sort of a scientist rank where you can go off the management path and you stay on the technical path. I think more companies need to have that kind of path for the people who, are, who don't have good EQ, who aren't good team players either. But you don't want toxic people. No. 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 Do, you, do you keep team members that, where you see potential and then you train them? Or do you, do you want kind of a working level from the beginning? No, no, I mean, again, it depends on your organization, whether you can afford to take people with, um, whether you can afford to take people with high potential. Um, and it really depends on, th there was this question about, if you're a management consulting company, would you rather hire someone who's smart but lazy or someone who's average but very hardworking? Turned out the answer for most consulting companies is you want to hire someone who's smart but lazy because you can force them to work very hard. And consulting firms like Bain are very good at doing that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you avoid trivial and obvious strategy statements such as increase profitability by X? How do you formulate something concrete and less obvious? No, no, no. Increase profitability by X is perfectly fine as a target. The thing is, what strategies are you going to identify to get there? Reformulating the product, moving into a new geographic area, etc. Those are the important things. I mean, uh, but you know, even setting the target can be difficult. You set the wrong target, like doubling our profit over in one year, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get negative, dysfunctional, dishonest behavior. People will, if you set targets that are not reachable by honest means, they're going to cheat, as Volkswagen found. They said double the market share in North America, and they got the diesel cheating scandal. <laughs> and the CEO may end up in jail. So. Yeah. To each their own. <laughs> I always like to keep my students out of jail. Yeah. The, um... <laughs> it's a good way to start. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> how can you build a bold strategy that employees will still follow? Um, Is there something as, as that, that exists that's called too bold? Yeah, sorry, I, I keep using the two favorite words in business schools. It depends. So if, if you're an Apple, do you know what Steve Jobs had the mission of Apple? The mission of Apple is to change the world. I mean, you couldn't get more high level than that. And that was the kind of company where people responded to that, right? Other companies, they'd laugh at you and say, this is ridiculous. And Apple did succeed in, in changing the world. Actually, I have a one, my favorite example of a bold statement. When Toyota launched the Lexus car division to go up against Mercedes, they had a very simple two-word slogan in every office, in English, in every factory design center. It's beat Benz. <laughs> Memorable, motivational, uh, measurable, and it worked. They caught up with Mercedes-Benz technically. <laughs> it's to the point. Yeah, you, you, need, your, you need your beat yeah. Benz. Yeah. Every one of your companies needs a beat Benz slogan. <laughs> um, can you explain your statement? of rebel from the top a bit further. Where is the rebel in only taking on large challenges when you have great firepower? Well, because you're, you're well, you don't actually have that great firepower, actually. I couldn't fire anybody, really, sadly. Um, <laughs> you know, Danish and Dutch labor laws, etc., and in academia. The, the thing is that um, you are taking on very difficult challenges. Um, so. I was rebelling against the culture uh, at Rotterdam School of Management, which you know, the culture was only academic journal articles matter, let's not connect to business world. So I, I was an internal rebel. I was a rebel at the top. 
Yeah. And I've done it at lower levels. I've done it at lower levels as well. Yeah. And can you explain more about if you kept the small rules, you could break the big ones? Yes. So um, if you are, just to broaden it a bit, if you're a constant uh, pain in the rear end for your colleagues, when you do something big that's a mis big mistake, you lose a lot of money, they're going to pounce on you and get rid of you. Right? But if you're a nice guy and you don't challenge the small rules and you go along with things, um, that works. I, I first got this in college, and I kept all the small rules in college and eventually at Cambridge, and I was eventually caught breaking the two biggest rules. I won't tell you what they are. Um, and uh, I got away with both of them because I was thought of as being a good citizen who didn't otherwise break the rules. It's always the nice guys. It's always the nice guys that follow the rules, right? Yeah. And then in reality, you know, yeah. you're, you're a troublemaker <laughs> in reality. <laughs> uh, does DQ, decency quotient, from AJ Banya, have a place in transformational change? Um, actually, I'm, actually, I'm a decent person, so one of the things I, I, I joke about it, but one of the things I did was to eliminate the politics in the organization and get rid of bullying and to advance women and diversity, etc., and have an open-door policy. Um, organized transformation usually requires firing people, so that's a nasty thing to do. If you're going to have to do that, you have to do it in the most decent way possible. So I think that's where it comes in directly. Even if you don't fire people, you're going to sideline people in their careers. You have to do it in a decent way. Mm. And I uh, just relate to that. I mean, I always respect people for their roles. So I always respected the cleaners in the offices I worked in. Talk to the cleaners, make friends with them, because they're doing a great job in their role as a cleaner. And I remember this because my first day at UCLA in Los Angeles, I came out of my office and another cleaner said to me, oh, are you here to do the carpets today? So she mistook me for a cleaner, which I thought was great. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your questions coming through. We've got a bit more time on, on Slido, a, a couple more. I, I, I wanted to ask you, though, do you think that at some stage we, we try to outthink ourselves or out-psychology ourselves with regards to corporate behavior? And in reality... You know, we talk about we need to do you know, this and this and this method to get to the top. Or we want to achieve this, then we need to do that and that and that. But in reality, we would get further by being genuine and let everything take its course. Um, you can't... The, the essence of a strategy is that you've got some kind of planned sequence of moves. You don't have to have it all thought out. I only ever used approximate strategies and developed them as they went along. But you can't just, you know, um, stumble along without a strategy. If you're trying to do something difficult, the more difficult the thing you're trying to do, the more strategic you have to be to think about how you're do doing it. So another definition of mine is that you use strategy to get a greater return on your resources. Right? Strategy gets you a better return on the limited resources that you have. If you don't have a plan, you better have lots of resources. Again, I don't think the people in this room have access to unlimited resources. Do you think enough is put in place for the next couple of decades in terms of some of the bigger things that are happening? Like today we've heard about the metaverse, uh, the, the metaverse, metaverse, oh, met metaverse, yeah, metaverse, yeah, yeah metaverse. it's incredibly hard to hear. Uh, um, uh, digitalization, back to work after COVID. Do you think, do you think there's enough of a, of a succinct strategy in place for these changes coming? No, I mean, lots of companies are trying to do that. And again, for you in this audience, there's many opportunities for companies like yours to contribute, uh, to, contribute to this. And I, I love, the, was it Manny Machado who said, the barriers to sustainability are the accountants? So, that, you know, the very specific, really understand what is happening in, uh, in the organization. And again, you know, given that large organizations are, are often rigid and can't do things, you have fantastic opportunity to embrace those um, new opportunities. Um, 
if, in if, a sense, we know what they are. We know what the, next, the trends of the next 20 years are. And, and if you are looking at transforming companies, yeah. what, what are the biggest risks that you need to be aware of? Um, I call it the uh, monkey law of the jungle. You, you sometimes see dead monkeys at the bottom of the jungle because they're swinging from one branch to the other. So in transformation, you know, let go of one, if you let go of one branch, you better be sure you can reach the other branch. And many companies end up dead on the jungle floor because of the failed transformation. Don't be one of the dead monkeys. <laughs> um, how do you draw the line between following a strategy and collaborating with your team? Um, well, it, it, it depends uh, who you are. Um, if you're talking about a team, perhaps you're a middle manager, there's a strategy that's come down from the top, you're working with your team to interpret the strategy, to implement it in the best way possible. I, I think that, that would be my answer to that. Good. A couple more questions. Um, staging the moments of theater bring along a risk that the organization won't accept what the leader tries to suggest. Any suggestions on diminishing that risk? I mean, it has to align with what is good for the organization. If we go back to the example of um, uh, the Chinese company pushing quality, people sort of knew that they had to improve quality. So they were somewhat ready for this um, moment theater. I mean, similarly, Lou Gerstner, he, he knew that he had economic logic behind him, that they needed an integrated European strategy. It wasn't just an idea a whim out of the top of his head. He, he just wanted to you know, run over those things where you know, the French guy says to the German, you can't do it this way in my country. All right, so he just, they, they were sort of primed for it, and the moment of theatre pushed them over. But whenever you do anything as a leader, there's always a risk. So be uh, ready to fall on your face sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, a good question here. Uh, we all know IQ tests and EQ tests. How do you test for OQ? I was actually asked that yesterday. I, I think you could actually uh, develop that. And I think I'm going to develop and um, patent the test and make a lot of money from it. But uh, it, it might be possible. You, you know, there's sort of the multiple choice things. Um, here's the situation. You're given the choice of doing A, B, or C, which you do. I mean, there are EQ tests. So I think you could, uh, you could develop that. But, um, Good. Thank you for that question, whoever it was. The, um. I think you should develop it. <laughs> Definitely. <clears throat> Why not? Uh, the conference this year is about growth. And we always like to leave people with something tangible that they can take away, try to implement or think more about. What would you leave the audience with as we wrap with regards <clears throat> to like what, what should they take away and go back and implement or think about for their businesses? Well, it, it's the idea of clever strategies. All of you want to increase your revenues, right? You want to get much more growth than you've had in the past. How do you have clever strategies that will deliver on that growth? It could be partnering with somebody unusual to, to do that. Um, I, I, mean, I, I can't do it for you, but you, know, you could have brainstorming ideas internally in your company, but it's not the obvious ways. It's not just doubling yours. If you want to double sales, don't just double the sales force. Don't just double the advertising. What can you do that's clever to get you to double the revenues without having to double the expenses? Okay. Couple more? Okay. Couple more? Yeah? <clears throat> okay. Uh, can you distinguish strategy development and strategy execution or do they need to go hand in hand? No, I mean, the, the, the two are separate. Um, so there's a strategy development process. Now, typically, there's a feedback loop. So as you execute, you may decide that the strategy isn't quite right. So you adjust the strategy. But the way you tie it together is that you should only formulate strategies that are executable by your organization. Okay? So, and that is the most important thing. So sometimes companies come up with a really nice strategy that their organization can't execute. 
at this time. Um, now, you, of course, you want to have a, a stretch objective. So what other capabilities do we need in the organization to be able to execute that strategy? But don't go for the wrong strategy, i.e. the strategy that is wrong for you, like Microsoft moving into the mobile phone business. That was the wrong strategy um, for them. Um, how should you use management consultants in strategy formulation, if at all? <clears throat> you should use them all the time. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing about uh, executives is that a 50-year-old executive has perhaps, if they haven't been a consultant, has perhaps you know, undergone one, two strategic transformations, has implemented three, four, five major strategies, well, the consultants do it all the time. They've seen it across a large number of, uh, large number of industries. So they specialize. So it's like bringing in a specialist. It's not that they do it all for you, but they can be helpful, particularly when you're trying to come up with a new paradigm. Sometimes it's a disaster. Um, one of the world's leading companies, I better not name them, consultants, bankrupted Swiss Air. They bankrupted Swiss Air with the wrong strategy. So it can go wrong. <laughs> That's a hard one to build for. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? It's a hard one to build for. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, OK, very last question. Which time horizon should strategy be developed for? Again, it depends. <laughs> on, it depends on the nature of the assets. You know, if you're in the nuclear power plant business, you better have a 50-year strategy. All right? If you are in fast fashion, like Shein, the Chinese company, that is now pretty much the biggest you know, female fashion, f $5 average sale. You know, th their strategies don't last very long. But their business model doesn't change, right? So the business model can stay fixed for three years. So it, it also depends what you mean by strategy. So I apply strategy to everything. You could have a corporate strategy, division strategy, functional strategy, area strategy, like strategy for Denmark. Um, so it depends. Okay. Thank you so much, George, for sharing your, uh, your knowledge. Thank you for answering all the audience questions as well. Uh, that is it for our speakers. Thank you so much, George. Thank you. Thank you all. Give a hand of applause. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Shall I leave? Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Um, that is it for 